everybody. Welcome back to the Full Armor of God podcast. I'm your host, Don Purdom. So I've been away for a few weeks taking care of business and, and working on a few other uh, things that, that I had to give attention to. And so my apologies for being away for a little while to all my uh, loyal and dedicated listeners. And I hope that uh, as we get going here, you'll come back and not just listen now, but over and over again and absorb some of the things that, uh, that I believe are fundamental beliefs to Christianity, things that somehow we have along the journey of things over the last thousand years in particular, we've, we've lost the context of what it sometimes means to be a Christian. And this is where we get all these splintering of groups from. I've talked about this in recent podcast. And these splinterings happen because we have all of these roads that we're going down of what we think the Bible means. And we kind of get removed from time and get a little bit lazy. We lose its historical context, its cultural context. You know, what happened during the time of King David was not what was happening in Jesus' time. But it's so easy to not teach these things because it's hard. It requires work and effort on our part to really dig in and understand. Today, that's what I want to do. I want to dig in really deep and get a different perspective of this pivotal moment in history when Jesus comes into the world, the, the, the Son begotten of the Father, the God-man, fully human, fully man, fully God, comes from heaven to earth. And we're coming up in the Protestant tradition of Easter. And as an Orthodox Christian, I, I practice Easter, according to a lunar calendar, a little bit different, but that's okay. Because at the end of the day, what we're worshiping is the risen Savior, which we're going to see on Easter Sunday. And then later at Pentecost, the Ascension, and everything changes, it seems. But does it? This is an interesting question we need to ask ourselves. Did there, was there something that fundamentally changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament? I don't even like the words old and new because it... It connotates that something in the past was wiped out and isn't relevant anymore. And folks, that couldn't be further from the truth. Today, I want to talk about something we don't talk about often in Christian tradition. We don't talk a lot about the Torah. Some of you are probably going, what in the world is that? What is a Torah? Well, Torah are the five books that begin the Bible. This is what the Jewish people referred to as a Torah throughout the centuries. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And a lot of people think that the Torah is just a set of laws, a set of things that you must do to satisfy God's wrath so that he doesn't come and condemn you. But this is a fundamental misunderstanding of Torah. So let's kind of jump into it, because this is one of the most confusing and controversial terms in the Hebrew language, but also in Christian history, because the church has said, you know, this is just complicated. I'm going to ignore it. We're going to push it to the side. It doesn't really matter anyway because of what Jesus did. And, and doing that creates a fundamental misunderstanding of Jesus's ministry and the Gospels, and how we live our life today. So let's jump into this. Now, rabbinic law, rabbinic Jewish law, taught us to think about the Torah as a book of laws and rituals. But there's a flaw with that. See, there are laws in Torah. That's Leviticus is the Levitical law. It's the priesthood. It's how and why you would offer up sacrifices. Well, talk about that. I've talked a little bit about that over the last number of Bible studies here in the podcast about unintentional sin and intentional sin and the difference of how those two things are treated. But there's a literary genre of of Torah. It's not a book of laws. It's actually a narrative. It's a story. And originally it was written in one book called the Book of Moses. And then later on, that book is divided into the five different books that I just talked about, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, the laws and commandments, they only take up a very small part of the whole of Torah. 
When you read Genesis and you read Exodus, you see these are written in narratives. They're written in storytelling form. They're telling the story of what happened and why later these laws were needed. So it isn't just our own understanding. There's also an academic understanding. Dr. Chaval once wrote that the Torah, which contains most of the laws, is not a collection of laws, but rather a narrative that tells the history of the Jewish people in their earliest days. Therefore, we can view the Torah as a source of laws and even construct a set of laws from it. But this is not adequate grounds to interpret the Torah outside of its literary genre, which is a narrative. The fact that the biblical laws are always found in a liter literary context, not in a legal context, means that the laws are indisputably tied to the means and purposes of the literary context in which they're found. The Torah is first and foremost a narrative and not a law book, and it needs to be treated accordingly. That's some pretty weighty stuff in a different context than most of us will give when we think about Torah because it's what we do. We think about it as a legal set of do's and don'ts. But it's so much more than that. Let me explain. What do I mean? Well, one of the, the best known stories in Torah is about Abraham. See, God chooses Abraham to start a nation, the people of Israel, who after some time find themselves enslaved in Egypt. And from the people of Israel, God chooses another man, Moses. And through Moses, God redeems the people of Israel and makes a covenant with them in Mount Sinai called the Sinai Covenant. Now, a covenant is a contract. That's how we should think about these things. And the, and the most important covenant that we see in all of the scripture is the Abrahamic covenant. And it's interesting because when we go in Genesis chapter 15, where we find the Abrahamic covenant, we see something unique that happens here. And I, again, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but I'm going to kind of go through this again. The Abrahamic covenant is a special covenant. It's a unique covenant. When a covenant's created, there are usually two parties involved. And the two parties agree that they're going to abide by this covenant. Now, in the ancient world, how did they do it? Well, we saw in Genesis 15 that they would take a numerous different animals, they'd cut them in half and make a walkway through the middle for the members making the covenant to make. And when they did this, they would literally give a vow that says, if I don't fulfill my end of the covenant, then I should be as these animals, meaning cut in half and dead, right? You broke the covenant. Well, what we see in in Genesis 15, beginning in verse 17, it says, It came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between those pieces. And on the day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the great river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates, and the Kenite, and the Kenzanite, and the Katamanite, etc., etc., etc. So it the point I'm making here is, is that the covenant that God makes with Abraham about his future descendants, which will become more numerous than all of the stars, it was one-way covenant. It was God giving a covenant with Abraham and with all of his descendants. It was not a two-way covenant. It was a one-way covenant. And God took that so serious that he said, my vow to you, Abraham, and to all that would follow you is if I break my covenant with you, let me be as these animals. Let me be dead. All right. So when we get into Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we see that the covenant is a contract and all 613 of the laws or commandments that Moses gave to the children of Israel are the terms and conditions of the contract or the covenant with Israel. This is the way that the people experience the covenant. So in other words, there's the Torah, which compromises the first five books of the Old Testament, and there are the commandments, which make up a small part within the Torah and are a part of a much bigger story. 
The commandments are actually laws that have to do with rites, rituals, customs, morals, social justice, and so forth that were given to a newly born nation to help them in the first step towards the light in an otherwise dark civilization and culture around them. Okay. So let's think about the first commandment that God gives to Moses, because culturally all around them is paganism. There are the Canaanites and the Moabites and all these different people groups, right? And they're all worshiping false gods. And the way that they worship these gods is is that something wrong happened. They did something wrong. They offer a sacrifice and they ask the gods to forgive them and and to then provide what they need. So, drought, right? There's a drought. They need the God's provision for rain so that the the rain would come down and fertilize the land and cause the crops to grow so that they would have food to eat. So, they are, I'm not going to get into all of that right now because that's not the purpose of our podcast. There's a lot of different things going on in there with these religions floating all around Israel. But the point is, is that the very first commandment that that Moses gives to the people is you shall have no other gods and you shall not make for yourself a carved image. And as soon as Moses gives the command, what is one of the first things they do? They go and they carve an image of a, of a calf, <laughs> of a golden calf. And then we have rebellion that appears and Moses ends up giving them more commandments. And then another story of rebellion occurs. And then again, there's more commandments. And what do we see? In Exodus, we see commandments, rebellion, commandments, rebellion. See the pattern? The purpose of the story, the narrative of Torah, is to show us that commandments weren't given without a reason, but they were given as a response to Israel's sinful actions. So it's kind of like, you know, a child breaks something and a parent decides that, you know what, from now on, you're not playing ball in the kitchen. You go outside and you play ball. But unlike an instruction manual in which all the instructions were written in advance, this is not an instruction manual for life, but it's a story of people whose character God is slowly fashioning, and he's restraining their behavior by setting up boundaries, and then he's correcting the bad behavior. That's what Torah does. And then God keeps raising his moral standards, and it's, it's, it's an it's a arduous process. We see this when, the, when, the, when, when God splits the Red Sea and they go through the Red Sea, you'd think they would be praising God, but not long after, they're complaining and they're moaning and they're groaning and, the, and it's painful. And they're saying, we should just go back to slavery in Egypt. Why did we do this? Right? And then we see all around them the wickedness of these cultures. And it's so easy to slip into those things. In modern times, we tend to read these commandments and we think that, boy, these are really weird. And why is this in here? That's just, God, what is wrong? Um, Why would God do and say these things? Why would he forbid them from having sexual intercourse with their mother or their animals? We wouldn't, who would do such an evil thing? Well, they would. Because the lust of their sinful desires had no boundaries to constrain them, they didn't know any better for a lack of a better expression. They were animalistic. They were barbaric. You know, why were there laws to cover up your pits you've dug to prevent something from falling into them? It seems like common sense. If you dig a hole in the ground, you should cover it so people don't fall in it, right? Apparently, it wasn't such common sense. There were laws that forbid people to drink blood as if you're a vampire or laws to forbid you from sacrificing your child by fire to an idol. And there's a whole lot of other laws that would make you think, what kind of a barbaric group was Moses dealing with here? Right. We have to think about it now. Torah, the laws and commandments in Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, they were meant to suppress criminals and to defend the weak. The purpose of the law was to create basic law in order in a cor- to, well in order to create order <laughs> in a corrupt and barbaric society. Paul explained it like this in 1 Timothy 1:9. He has a thousand or two thousand years of 
reflection to be able to think about this, right? But no less inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, understanding this, that the law is not laid, is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, and on and on the list goes, right? The Ten Commandments, think about it, how basic the Ten Commandments are. You would think that it wouldn't need to be written down, that you don't murder, you don't steal, you don't bear false witness, you don't lust, you don't covet things, you honor the request of your parents. On and on, you would think that there are normal things that they don't need to be told. But think about it for a second. We have these things, we've had these things for three or so thousand years, and yet we still do these things in our society today. There's still murder. They're still stealing. They're still lying. They're still coveting things that don't belong to you. Those things still exist. But here's the point. The, the laws weren't written for normal people, and they weren't meant to represent God's ultimate moral standards. They were meant to restrain the human heart, which at that time was so wicked, and it was so corrupt. They were so far from God. So when we approach the commandments, it's vital to remember the cultural, social, and historical context that they were living in. See, they were not innocent people. These commandments were given to a people who had been slaves. These were people who had experienced extreme oppression and physical and mental abuse. They didn't have any education or standing in society. They were influenced by a pagan, barbaric, and twisted Egyptian culture that had very, very, very low morals and principles or values. You, you, you could almost say that these Israelites had become a bunch of hooligans. They were, they were controlled by the Egyptians on one hand and then set free to do whatever on another hand as long as they fulfilled their slavely responsibilities. These people needed to learn basic things. They, they needed to learn that murder wasn't good, stealing's not good, coveting isn't good, adultery is not good. They needed to learn all of these things, right? So on the one hand, you're dealing with merciless barbarians. And on the other hand, for the very first time, they're introduced to God's grace and his compassion. Interesting. Here's the important thing about Torah. The commandments and, and Moses' covenant were, were not God's ultimate moral standards, but they were a temporary compromise on godly standards for us, for people who are sinners. Why? Because our hearts are so hard. This is the heart of Torah. There is a direct correlation between knowledge and morality. And when we know God, in other words, when we know his character and his will, our moral principles and our eth ethical standards actually go up. And Torah and its laws were only a first step, a first step out of a moral sloth and towards godly morals. Now, let's think about this for a second here, because there's some things that even Jesus said about this, about the commandments of Torah. In Matthew 19, he says, because of the hardness of, of heart, Moses allowed you, dot, 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 right? He's talking about, in this case, divorce. But from the beginning, it was not so. So because of the hardness of hearts, they and we were allowed to in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, to take revenge, to get divorced, to take slaves, and do all kinds of things today that we would consider abominable. But originally, these things were different. We, we can find God's ultimate standards that were way before Torah, before sin permeated creation in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, we saw perfection. He didn't have to tell Adam and Eve, don't murder. He didn't have to tell them to not steal. So what is the law? What is Torah? It's preventative and it's a restraint. God's standard is to love. 
to love even your adversary. Jesus says in Luke 20, in Luke 6, 27 and 28, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. God's standard is do not steal. Rather, we need to be generous towards everyone. Luke 6, 38, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with your measure, you use it. It will be measured back to you. See, the first attributes of the, of the Torah, of the commandments of Torah, is that their purpose was to restrict the behavior of the Israelites, their corrupted heart right? To put constraints around it, to teach it, to mold it, to quarantine it. So then when you begin to see, don't do these things. Why? Because of love. Think about Exodus 21, 24 to 25. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, we got to put things back in its proper context again, right? A culture of barbarism. It's cruel. It's vengeful. It's vengeful. These are bloodthirsty people. And the purpose of this commandment was to restrain and restrict this kind of behavior. If someone hurts you, you can't kill him or her child as an act of revenge. The revenge you're allowed to take is restricted. Instead, wound for wound. Yet, you know, we got to think about this. This is not a picture of God's ultimate moral standard. Let's look at what Jesus said about this verse in Matthew 5, 38 to 44. He said, you have heard that it was said. Where did they hear it said? They heard it in the synagogues. They heard it in the reading of Torah. They heard it in Talmudic literature. Remember the Talmud? I have not taught about this yet. To, to most of you, but the Talmud coming out of the Babylonian period was created as a fence around Torah. It's made to be even more rigid than Torah, so that if you if you can't break Talmud, then you can never break ta- uh, Torah, and we can never go back into captivity. This is what was on the mind of the Jewish people coming out of captivity, and you have hundreds of years of tam- Talmudic literature being derived and an oral tradition being created that by the time you get to Jesus, you've got a twisting of Torah, a fundamental misunderstanding, which by the way, the Gnostics used and carries on into this day. People will say today, we don't need Torah. Torah doesn't exist anymore. Jesus abolished it. And that's not what he did. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. And they'll say, well, fulfillment, abolishment, same thing. And we'll get to that. But think about this other, stand, this other statement, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? Matthew 5, 38 to 44, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. (laughs) Think about it. Where Moses restricted and and restrained in Torah, Jesus raised the standards back up to God's ultimate moral standard. In this case, instead of going out and starting a never-ending cycle of revenge, Jesus says, don't do that, forgive. Jesus is talking about taking revenge on the person who did the offense and not on the act of offense itself. Of course, you're allowed to demand that the authorities do justice and handle the violators. Jesus is talking about, I love it when the dogs start barking in the background, right? So anyway, now that I quiet the dogs down, (laughs) the thing here is that Jesus is talking about taking revenge on the person who did wrong. Contrary to Torah, which restricts the act of revenge, yet still allows it in measure, Jesus tells us not to take revenge on the person who did us wrong at all. In fact, if your neighbor accidentally hurts your sheep, you don't need to go and hurt his sheep as well. You can just forgive him. Did your other neighbor steal your donkey? Don't take revenge by killing his family. Just go to the police and let them deal with it. 
Matthew 5.39, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him and also the other. Now, Jesus is not some radical pacifist. That's not, see, we've taken it out of context because we don't understand Jesus's context. We don't understand Torah. So some Christian groups who are pacifist will take him out of context, right? That, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not a pacifist. He's expressing his frustration at the lack of justice. The Apostle Paul acted similarly in Acts 22. And, you know, Jesus, he just has a different point. In order to slap someone's right cheek, one needs to use the back of the hand. It's, it's degrading and it's a humiliating act against someone. And during the Second Temple period, this was especially used by Roman guards. When a Roman guard would, whether it was right or wrong, justifiable or not justifiable, when they would slap a common citizen, many of the Jews would be so humiliated to receive such a treatment from a Roman Gentile that they would lose their temper and fight back. Not against the evil itself, but against whom? The evildoer, the Roman guard. And what would the reaction be? To strike the guard back. And this brought all kinds of consequences to a, quote, insurrectionist, and even to his family, and sometimes even to the whole community. And from our times, you know, say a police officer strikes you and humiliates you, you need to take him to court and not try to hit him back. There's a different way of handling it than eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Matthew 540, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, let's think about this. In Exodus chapters 22, verse 25, if you borrowed clothing from someone, you need to return it before the sun goes down. However, Jesus said if someone threatens to sue you because you borrowed something and didn't return it, don't wait for it to be settled in court. Return a shirt and compensate him further by giving him your cloak as well. This way you'll both cover the debt and appease the other person. See, this is what's really going on in this passage. Matthew 5.41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, the rabbinic Jewish law, based on number 17, 21, and 35, forbids a Jew to carry anything or to even walk over one mile on a Sabbath. <laughs> but on the other hand, Roman law granted Roman soldiers permission to force a citizen to walk with them up to a mile and also to carry something for them. You know, this was hard work being a Roman soldier. It was heavy. This was their way of getting rest. So in Matthew 27 and Mark 15, we see that the Roman soldiers forced Simon to carry Jesus's cross. Jesus's point in this verse is you need not only be willing to pay your dues according to the laws of the country, but do it with the right attitude as well. Not with a sour face, not griping and complaining and carrying on all of the time, but with a generous spirit and open-handedly. Matthew 5.42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who will borrow from you. This is taken from Deuteronomy 23 and Exodus 22. Now, the Israelites were allowed to exact interest from foreigners they lent many t money to, but not from other Israelites. Jesus, however, teaches that if a person in need asks for your help, it doesn't matter who he is. It doesn't matter if it's a Gentile. It doesn't matter if it's an Israelite. If he's hurt, help him. Help anyone and everyone in needs. In other words, whereas a Torah prevented exploitation, Jesus demonstrated to us God's ultimate moral standards, which is grace. Matthew 5, 43, 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> See, in the Talmud, it's permitted to actually hate them. And Jesus is teaching the exact opposite. How do you pray for your enemies? You forgive them, then you pray for them. So here's the point. Our flawed hearts were under confinement of Torah, whose purpose was to restrain us. Now no, we no longer need to be under confinement. Today we have the cure. And who is the cure? The cure is Jesus Christ, the Messiah.
We no longer are under confinement or restraint so that we won't commit transgressions and hurt others. See, God's ultimate moral standard has always been and always will be grace, compassion, forgiveness, and love. In Messiah, we know to go the extra mile by faith and not because of laws and rituals. We see this throughout the New Testament, Galatians 3.19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, rebellious, purposeful sin, until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. So let's talk about Jesus and the fulfillment of the messianic hope of the Torah and the prophets. Now, in John 5.46, Jesus said, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And in five, Matthew 5, 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, an iota and a dot, these are the two smallest letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And Jesus is saying here that the authority of the scriptures remains valid. The authority of the Old Testament remains valid until all that has been written is fulfilled including the prophecies that have not been fulfilled yet in the last days. So does that mean we're to just to ignore Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Is that what that means? Should we just forget about it and move on? Well, of course not, because Jesus said we shouldn't. It would be a mistake to ignore them completely. See, The Torah not only reveals the weakness of the human heart, it also teaches us about the holiness and the grace of God. They show us wisdom. They give us knowledge. They they deepen our understanding concerning the character and the work of our Savior, of the Messiah, and it compels us to love God and to love man. See, without the Torah, we would have never known or been able to recognize Messiah or even know that we needed him. We recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, just as he himself said in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. And in John 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. See, we actually need to keep Torah, not break Torah, not keep it in the sense of following rituals and stuff like that, but in keeping its spirit, its purpose. See, opposed to the rabbinic definition of today, which defines keeping Torah as performing external rituals and practices that aren't even related to the Torah, truly keeping the Torah is to believe in Jesus the Messiah and to follow him. And followers of Jesus are true followers of Moses in every and true sense of that meaning. To keep far more than just the commandments of given to Moses, but by giving love to God and to others. Is this not what Jesus said the two great commandments were? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are taken from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Right. And let's think about this. While Torah is God's words in every sense, we need to remember we're no longer under the authority of the Mosaic Covenant. See, in the Mosaic Covenant, we serve God through the priesthood and sacrifices in the tabernacle and later in the temple. The priests were the mediators between God and the people and the commandments of the Mosaic Covenants, and they showed us how to serve God in the framework of that covenant. In the new covenant, we are under the Torah of the Messiah. He is our great high priest who brought us a Torah with much higher and with much more challenging standards in comparison with those in the Mosaic covenant. Hebrews 7.12 says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So for those who want to try to keep the commandments of the Torah, You know, you can do that, but certainly not necessary. Because according to Acts chapter 21, after the temple was destroyed, the Apostle Paul acted in a similar manner that he kept going to 
the synagogue. He kept going to the temple. He kept the rituals. But afterwards, in 1 Corinthians 9.20, we see, to those under the law, I, I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law, meaning the Jewish people. But the goal of Torah, the purpose of the commandments, the role of true Jewish tradition, well, it was to expose God's love, grace, mercy, and tenderness. Jesus didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled it. And by living according to the way the Apostle Paul reminds us, under grace, we too live under Torah in that way. We see, you know, this Bible study I've been going through with those who come on Sunday nights and then I've been working through those. We, we see in Genesis over and over how God gives grace and mercy and tenderness. We saw with King David, despite breaking seven of the Ten Commandments, God's mercy and grace and tenderness and his salvation to King David. We see in the book of Judges, despite rebellion over and over, and it gets worse and worse under each judge, we still see God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. And even though Solomon broke, violently broke, he did Pesa, he, he defiantly rebelled God by worshiping false gods. God still had mercy on Solomon because of his father, David. And we're going to see this pattern repeated over and over of rebellion and forgiveness. Rebellion and forgiveness. To the point that God, though, gets so frustrated with them, and we're going to see in the prophets that he says, stop it. Stop it with the new moons and the festivals and all of this stuff that you keep coming back to me with. I don't want your sacrifices. What I want is your heart. I want you to love me. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. This was the point of Torah. This was the point in the foreshadowing of the Torah, in the fulfillment of it in the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus of Nazareth, it was pointing to him, fully God and fully man, that he gave himself for us. And it is in this that we see the fulfillment of Torah and how we live our lives today. All right, I'll have more to say on this in the future because we can't disconnect the past from the present or the future. It all works synonymously. God didn't change. He wasn't a different God in Genesis. He wasn't a different God at creation. He wasn't a different God for Abraham or a different God for Moses or a different God for all of the prophets. He wasn't a different God in Jesus. He is the same. The Shema holds true. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And Paul reminds us that you and I are grafted into, as Gentiles, we were grafted into the church. The church has always existed. It existed in Israel, and now it exists in both Israel and the Gentiles. We were always supposed to be part of God's redemptive plan. Israel was never supposed to hoard God. It was supposed to extend God's grace to the world. So, my brothers and sisters, as we approach Easter Sunday in the Protestant tradition, let us think about more deeply these meanings that Jesus gives when we see him preparing to offer up his life this week. May we see Torah in him, because remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. Jesus is the Word. He is the author of Torah. He is the fulfillment of it, in that how he lived is how we are supposed to live. That is the fulfillment, not the abolishment, the fulfillment. All right. God bless you, brothers and sisters. This is heavy stuff. <laughs> I'm glad you stuck with me this long. We're going to have a lot more to say about this over the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. And I'm looking forward to engaging with you and wrestling with you in this. This is, this is heavy stuff. So God bless you. Thank you so much for listening in. And uh, I'll see you again, or you'll hear me again. 
very, very shortly because we're going to mix things up a little bit. I'm probably not going to be doing as much writing. Instead, I'm going to be doing more podcast form, and we'll see about how we mix that in with the with the uh, content at uh, faithandtrust.org. So thank you very much again. I love every one of you. God bless you.